This is the Fantasy Football Unlimited Podcast with your host, Kevin Murray. Happy Halloween and welcome to the Fantasy Football Unlimited Podcast. On this special episode of the Fantasy Football Unlimited Podcast, we have an ultra-talented guest. If you've been privileged to see his start, sits, and salutation videos on YouTube, well, then your life has been made better by the works of this man. He's been a, a fantasy football analyst at Front Yard Fantasy and is now the community ambassador for football guys. It's the one and only Marty McFly. No, no, it's it's, it's Joey Wright. <laughs> we can maybe Marty go with Joey McFly. Joey McFly. Joey McFly. McFly. I, like I love it. <laughs> Welcome in. Evan, oh, thank you so much for having me on. I was telling you before the show started, like I was just I just want to hang out today. I'm really looking forward to this. That's that's the plan. Let's uh, let's first, I guess, let's hop in your DeLorean, take a quick journey back in time, and uh, and Excellent. find out what it was like growing up. Were you were you a big sports fan as a kid? My first love, like first sports love as a kid, was college basketball. Um, we I lived in Melbourne, Florida when I was growing up, and we had Florida Tech, Florida, uh, Florida Institute of Technology, and I was their ball boy from the time I was like seven till I was like thirteen. I got to like travel with the team, and um, so college basketball was truly my first love. Um, and then like, you know, any sports like a gateway. So then I became a Florida Gator fan living in Florida and a diehard Atlanta Braves fan as I got a little bit older. Love it. I was, I was a big, you know, Seattle Mariner baseball was, was pretty terrible. Yeah. Obviously Griffey came and that was, that was truly special. But back in the day, TBS always had Atlanta Braves games on. So, mm -hmm. so I loved the Braves, you know, especially with, you know, with Maddox and Glavin and Smoltz and, you know, and all this guy, David Justice and Ron Gant, all those guys oh. uh, were huge to me. But I was like, I, you know, I had, you know, Atlanta Braves starter jacket back in the day. And, and that was nice. my squad for 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 several years. Kind of jumped back and forth. You know, again, Seattle sports were were pretty tricky. So I learned early to be a fan of the players instead of just the teams. But I'm still a Seattle homer. But that's that's awesome. So what about football? When did you dive into like professional football? Um, so kind of with Florida Gators, um, I was a big Emmett Smith fan as a kid, uh, when he played for the Gators. So when he went to the Cowboys, uh, for, I had like a, what are the, what's the phrase where you just had like a short window of time? Like, uh, I don't know what the phrase is, but I had like a date with the Cowboys. I didn't marry them. I just had a nice little relationship with them. I eventually moved on to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, but that was probably my first pro football love was, um, those Emmett Smith Cowboys teams with Troy Aikman and Mike Lurbin. So, and we yeah, got to meet Mike a... Lurbin. Back in, yes, uh, we January. did. That was we pretty did. cool. That was, that was pretty cool for sure. And yeah, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. I mean, look at look. I'm, I'm, you inspired me. I appreciate it, <laughs> Marty. Yeah. Marty McFly. I love it. <laughs> uh, so, when did you discover fantasy football? Uh, around 2009, I was working for Barnes and Noble. Um, I mentioned I'm a Florida Gator fan, but uh, truly one of my like life friends, uh, Phil Lebetsky, was a def uh, defensive back at Florida State. And the reason he just didn't play a lot was because he played behind this guy named Derek Brooks. Uh, so wow. I guess I just kind of got in his way a little bit. But Phil yeah. introduced me to fantasy football, invited me into my first league, and just I got obsessed. <laughs> That's awesome. So when did, uh, what, uh, what content did you start consuming as a, just a, a fan of the game? So when I was working at Barnes and Noble, I was allowed to have like headphones and I worked in the back room, like when I was unloading boxes, uh, when I worked in the receiving area and I, uh, First podcast I ever pod put on was CBS Fantasy Football Today, and I truly, really never deviated away from them. I, Dave, Jamie, Heath, and Adam, like, were in my ear for almost a decade. Actually, it's been probably a decade. Yep, that's awesome. And I, and I've, you know, I saw at the expo, I saw your your rapport with Dave Richard. Richard, that's amazing. Like, I think um, it's pretty cool how how friendships have been created. You know, all these years later, huh? Yeah, they say like never meet your heroes, and I don't really think anyone should ever meet Dave. But I mean, no, Dave is. I mean, we'll probably talk about him a little bit later. He's been one of the coolest people, and I feel very fortunate that I've gotten uh, to build that relationship with him because he is just a wealth of knowledge, and he always truly is kind of looking out for me. So I appreciate that. That's great. So, what drew you into fantasy football? What uh, What do you love most about this this great game that we uh, that we enjoy? Um, I mean, I don't think it's an unusual tale. Like the whole football guy's philosophy is draft local. I mean, it keeps me connected with my friends. Um, I've had the same group of friends since I was in high school. And that's not because I just don't know how to make friends. Uh, I just, my grooms in my wedding, I've known since I was 16. Uh, and fantasy football, our golden gnome league is what's kept us together. You know, at least once a year, we're all meeting up as a giant group at a sports bar or what have you to have our draft. 
Um, we've had, you know, all of us have kids now. Uh, we're all married. It's It's been a really fun journey. And fantasy football has kind of been the glue that's kind of kept us together. And that's yeah, you know, that's my story too with with my home league. I mean, it's it's friends from elementary school, junior high, high school, family members, college, like all blended together. And that's you know that's why I love. That's why I'm so passionate about the home league experience because I know what an impact it can have. So it sounds like uh, you've had that too. Do you have a, a favorite home league experience? So um, the one and only year I ever got them to do a draft board, we had like a poolside draft at my buddy's house, and like we all dressed up for it. We all got Zuba's pants and. Um, you know, we had uh, one of our friends uh, that's not in the league who now actually is in the league, uh, put all the stickers up for us. But the draft took like three and a half hours and they were really upset by that. But I was I that was the time <laughs> of my life. <laughs> it's heaven, right? I mean, like, yeah, what's you, like what, oh. I love it. So what uh, what's you makes a great live draft? What's like a dream live draft for you? Uh, it's the people there. Put it in any city, any location. I mean, if I guess like a dream location, I never got to go to Vegas up until last year for the football guys retreat. And then I went back three weeks later. Um, I think you could do a real fun Vegas draft. I saw the was it women in fantasy football had a draft at Circa by the pool. with yeah. the big That would be really fun. And that'd be like a dream location. I think that'd be great. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, in regards to like last place punishments, I don't know if you do any of those, but is there one that you think is just the craziest out there or something that you've seen that, that gets you laughing the most? Well, I'll just say my golden gnome league, we have a thing cause we're the gnome. We have a thing called the troll and it is disgusting looking. It is a little statue. And the rule is you have to keep it displayed in your home in a prominent location. So you can't just stick it in a closet. Uh, like we're talking like fireplace, like mantle next to the family pictures. That's where the troll goes. If you get the troll, you've earned it. And therefore you must wear that as like a badge of honor. But I think like my favorite fantasy football punishment I've seen lately um, is when the guy has to go out on a date with a stuffed animal at a really nice restaurant. Um, because it's not just that he's going out like, you know, every person I've seen do it has had kind of a, you know, they take care of the server and stuff. So my wife used to be a, a server. So I always appreciate that, that they're not just, you know, they're, they're leaning into it. So I, yeah. I've enjoyed that as a punishment. That's great. How do in your home link, how do you determine draft order? Uh, reverse standings. It's not very fun. I try to get new stuff every year. Like we don't have anything fun. We do. Um, one year <laughs> I, I wanted to go to um, the horse, the horse racing track and like pick horses, but they weren't, they weren't into it. I got to find something fun for us. Cause we're a fun group of guys and yeah. reverse order standings. I'm not tooting my horn, but I never missed the playoffs. So I don't know what a front end draft position is. Uh, draft pick looks like I, i've never <laughs> seen one um I, I think i've the lowest i've ever had was like a, a seven pick and so nice. i would kind of like to see what like a top five pick looks like yeah i mean to me i think randomization <laughs> is is probably the best way to do it in, in a redraft okay. league so so many ways to, to read to i guess to randomize the order and so something like going to the horse track i mean that's that's fun that's definitely a fun idea do you have any uh like favorite preferred settings or formats in fantasy my favorite um, format, um, I used, my first job in the industry was with Razzball, and they play their Razzball on NFC, and they've got that cut line format where it's like the first 10 weeks is best ball, and then for the playoffs, you set a, a lineup, and each week more teams get cut, um, just knowing where the cut line is. I really enjoy that format. Um, oddly, this is my worst year in that league. I'm very upset by it, but I, that's my oh, that's favorite um, form play. But I've played in a guillotine league for the first time this year, um, yeah. and man that's so much fun oh wow <laughs> yeah yeah that's the football guy i'm still still surviving it, it's the weirdest thing because I've, I've taken the high points in three out of the last four weeks but it it doesn't matter because the one week i didn't i was second to last and i'm so sweating on that monday night so guillotine is 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 intense it's brutal um but it's definitely a fun thing to, to introduce into your as your array of, of fantasy leagues I love it. Yeah, I was a week one cut from the football guys guillotine league. I was the it's first brutal. man out. And I was like, oh. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I th I'm pretty sure Jeff Bell just got cut. And his oh, roster did he? Good. is so loaded. Like, it's oh, like nice. top to bottom. It's it's phenomenal. And they're all out there. It's just, it's it's pretty yeah. crazy. <laughs> uh, so when did you first start creating content for fantasy football? So, like, I played in the Raz Bowl uh, one year. And, um. I built up a good rapport with the guys there. And then they asked me if I would want to write. And so my first year was 2021, uh, just a couple years ago. And I did the waiver wire article for them for that whole season in 2021 at Razzball. Had a great time doing it. Learned a lot. Like we're a bunch of great guys over there. 
That's great. And then, so when did you connect with uh, Front Yard Fantasy and, and those extraordinary gentlemen over there? So I went to the expo and I, I had met them kind of in a little chat group earlier. I didn't really know anyone. And uh, Jay Felicio, who at the time was not part of Front Yard Fantasy, invited me in a chat group and I met Simon and JL. Then went to my first expo and Simon and I on the Friday night immediately hit it off. Like we just kind of were connected at the hip the whole weekend. And then Sunday, I kind of followed JL around like a little lost puppy. And it was the only company I reached out to after the expo to say, if there's ever anything I think I could do to help, I would love to, you know, do anything with you guys. And um, after about two months of phone calls and and whatnot, uh, JL, you know, finally brought me onto the team. That's awesome. So did you, that first expo, expo, did you go solo? I did. I went by myself. I've gone to all of them solo. Awesome. Um, there's yeah. been, a, I think we'll talk about expo a little bit later. There, there's definitely been a shift in how I have, been at the expo in a in a good way um it's, it's been fun to experience yeah the first time i went i mean it was i brought you know a couple of my best friends with me it was great and then the last two years solo and i i mean we'll talk about the expo but so yeah. cool just to be able to go there by yourself but you're not alone right it's such a no, cool community. not at all so uh so what did you, where did you find your inspiration for start sits and salutations um so i i love other people's content. I really do. Um, and my uncle Matt gave me some advice um, of kind of in life, look at what the job people aren't doing and go do it. And listen, I, I love doing start sit shows. Um, I do one on Sunday mornings with football guys, but I was like, you know, this could be a little more fun. So I just said to JL, I was like, Hey, could I go like with a camera to the park and try to record something? And a lot of it is, um, Mr. Rogers is what a lot of it turned into. Steve Irwin, because I do yeah. kind of lean into the animals a little bit. But there's one skit from SNL, and I'll reveal this now. I've never actually given the credit where credit's due, where um, Michael Keaton, it's Happy Easter with Michael Keaton. If you go and you watch that skit, you will say, oh, I see where. Now, it definitely morphed into something completely different. But that very first uh, starts in citation. It's a lot of that, of that dry humor. Um, even the oh, hi came from there. So yeah, that's yeah, amazing, amazing content. It's fun. It's just just watching those. It's it, it, yeah. you can't not be be happy and, and get a kick out of it. Even like the expo one you did was just was so good. So that good. was easily the most fun I've had, and that's when I learned oh, having people there with me is all is is quite a bit more fun. Um, yeah, to play well. <laughs> with people instead of animals because animals yeah. you never know what's gonna happen. But with people, yeah, that's could... part of the fun too. Some of the animals, yeah. Scenes. I'm just getting, you know, <laughs> just I'm dying watching that stuff. So, uh, tell me about your experience with football guys and your your new oh, role man. as community ambassador. Yeah, so I got brought onto the team back in January. Um, big ups to Dave Kluge, who basically just grabbed me by the collar and yanked me onto the team. There, um, I my starts and citations at Expo. I filmed a spot with Joe Bryant, and um, that was something like when I left, I was like, oh yeah. I knocked that interaction out of the park. And then Joe has become such a good friend. Um, Joe called me up about a week after Christmas and he's like, Hey, I want to bring you onto the team. And he's like, I don't know what I want you to do yet, but I want you to be a part of football guys. And I was like, absolutely. And I just thought I was going to, you know, write a couple articles, maybe hop on a show when they needed some help. And I feel like every week I've gotten more and more to do. And then this last year expo, I just kind of sat down to talk to Joe because, uh, you know, some cool things that happened. I, I got invited to flex in New York city. Uh, I got invited to King's classic. And I was like, you know, maybe this is something that I can do like as a profession, like for my full-time work. Cause I was a water yeah. technician beforehand. So I, I talked to Joe and then we went through a couple weeks of meetings and um, you know, Joe and I kind of put together what looks like it can be the ambassador role just to go out and just be an ambassador for football guys, go out, talk to the fans, draft local, like focus on the community, on people's local drafts um, and just having fun with it. And, you know, just to be the site where people want to have their fantasy leagues. So you know, that's what I'm doing there. And it, the role is expanding every week. We've got a lot of cool ideas. I don't think I'm allowed to talk about any of them. Joe is standing off camera right now, like just <laughs> with a stick. If I say anything, I'm not supposed to. Um, sorry, it. Joe goes further than just cursing on air. Sorry, Joe goes to <laughs> revealing company secrets. But we've got a lot of really cool things heading up. Uh, focusing a little bit on the commissioners. Um, yeah, we're, we're looking forward to some stuff coming up. Exciting. Very exciting. Now let's talk about the community, right? The fantasy football 
fantasy sports community. We've we've experienced the expo together. Uh, tell me about that that full on experience with the expo. How how the friendships you've made has has uh, impacted oh, your life. I've I've truly made lifelong friendships from that expo. That first year going in, knowing absolutely no one. My first interaction with like a quote unquote big name was Andy Barron's and I pooped the bed. I, I could not have had a worse interaction with someone, not on Andy's side, but I just, he asked me a question I wasn't expecting. Flash forward two years later, I'm hanging out with Andy and it's like, we're good friends. And it, that's kind of how this community is, is everybody is so approachable, so kind, so nice. My first expo, like I said, I knew no one. I uh, met a lot of made a lot of friendships going into the second year. I decided I'm going to film an episode here of starts and citations with my friends who I know that I can trust and have a lot of fun with turned out to be the best one. And then this last year, and this is probably you know, a little emotional. My favorite thing to ever come out of the expo is last year I went and I said to um, JL from your fantasy, I'm not really focused. I don't want to do any content. I really just want to like be there to thank the people that helped me you know, get to where I am. Not that I'm a movie star or anything like that, but I'm appreciative for what I have. I, I really am. And I was at the board game bar in Canton, Ohio. Uh, it's the Millstone. I highly encourage everyone to check that out when you go to Expo. Go to the Millstone. And I met a guy named Steve uh, Falcon there. And he was a very nice kid. And he said, I joined your uh, Scott Fishbowl League because I wanted to play with Dave Richard. And I said, okay. What I need you to do is tomorrow Dave's going to be here and he's actually going to be hanging out a little bit. Usually he leaves after the Kings classic draft, but he doesn't have to go anywhere. So he's actually going to be at the party for a little bit. Come find me and I'll introduce you to Dave. And sure enough, I, Dave and I were talking and I saw Steve walk up. I pulled Steve in, introduced them and I backed away. And it's my favorite thing that's ever happened because I did exactly for him in that moment. What so many other people have done for me over the last two years. That's and awesome. for that's me, that's what this whole community is about, is just building relationships. Uh, this is a really fun game we're playing, and there's no reason why there can't be an incredible community around it. That's such a cool story, and it, it definitely fits with the Expo. Again, there's been so many relationships made, and, and you know, from the whole spectrum of, of the fantasy community to the you know, the top analysts to the, you know, the biggest enthusiasts. Um, it's, it's a special, special event for sure. Now, tell me about the, the King's Classic experience you've had. So that was the thing I was looking forward to most at my first expo was going to watch the King's Classic draft. Listen to the CBS uh, Fantasy Today podcast, FFT Today. I got it. I nailed it. Uh, they talked about the King's Classic every year. Dave's in it. Um, it's something to really look forward to. And so I made a point and I went there, watched the whole thing, really enjoyed it. And I I won't say that I, I bugged my way into it, but I made it known that it was a goal of mine. And listen, I, they were starting an IDP league and I played in enough IDP leagues where I kind of understood what was going on. When I got in that room with some of the greatest IDP minds in this industry, um, I was a little, I, you know, I was a little, not over my head. Like I, I held my own for 50% of the draft, but when it came to the defensive guys, like these guys know their stuff, but it was so great to be part of that group. I, I like to call myself the personality of the group. Cause that's the only reason that I really deserve to be there is they need a little personality. <laughs> in there um but i actually uh craig reith has been a huge help uh this year getting in there i got to draft next to him somebody i've connected with two years ago never got to meet got to meet him this year at expo and we spent four and a half hours together drafting <laughs> in a draft That's room. Awesome. and um I went on like a three three game winning streak, and everyone was really excited for me. And then I lost this <laughs> last week, but that's okay. Um, that's just awesome. the king's classic, and it's truly the best of the best in a room. Yeah, no, it's good. And on the on the same side, uh, you you mentioned flex leagues uh, with like Jake mm -hmm. Seeley. How was that experience? Oh yeah, um, flex was was a blast. Um, I I love New York City. I was very involved in musical theater when I was in high school, and I hadn't been back to New York in a while, and uh, I really truly missed it. And the, that draft with Jamie Eisenberg and Chris Towers, um, and just everyone I got to meet at that draft, Joe Pisapia, just a great room of guys in like a little pub in the middle of Manhattan. Like, could not have been a better experience. And that night, got to hang out with a lot of guys from The Athletic, uh, like Nano Dofino, but Jake Seeley. Uh, my favorite thing to come out of Flex was definitely Ubering through New York with Jake Seeley. I have this thing <laughs> where I like to talk to the Uber drivers if they've really? got a good personality. And um, I just wish there was a camera on us for that car ride because 
um, Jake and I were laughing so hard. And just another instance of, it's not the expo, but with Flex, of building those relationships in such a great community. Yeah, Jake. Jake is, is, is special. Jake's great. I've spent some time with him at past FSGAs, you know, several years ago where just, just such a good guy to be around and his, when he travels, there are, things are always happening to him. So it's, it's funny to hear his stories. Let's dive into some rapid fire questions. I'll throw out some questions. Okay. You just give me the first things that come to mind. What has been your most difficult challenge in the fantasy industry thus far? So I used to be a film critic and with that comes a lot of criticism and a lot of negativity. I think the hardest thing for me is to not revert back to that, which I know and be negative. Like I, I project this whole positive nature and positive attitude. And while that has definitely become a part of me, I definitely look to inspiration all the time to get to that point. Cause like anyone I can get negative. And so for me, you know, there's, a, there is negativity on Twitter that goes out there and a lot of targeting that just doesn't need to be there. And for me, the hardest thing is not responding to it. Cause I make a point of not responding to it. Cause I don't really think there's a point to that's the hardest part for me. That makes sense. I think a lot of people deal with that for sure. Uh, what do you enjoy most about what you're doing in the industry right now? Kind of that story of uh, Steven and Jake uh, and Dave, uh, just bringing people together, having a good time, like just making fantasy football, a community, having fun with it. That's kind of what I love the best about it and talking to animals in a, in a funny hat <laughs> with a mustache. <laughs> I enjoy that I love it. <laughs> <laughs> what have you learned most about yourself over the past five years? Yeah, I, to not be afraid to put myself out there. I have not gotten anything that I haven't asked for. And I, I say that as no one's just going to hand anything to you. You kind of got to take a leap from here from time to time. And that could be as simple as me when I said to JL, like, if there's ever anything I could do just to help. I mean, that's a baby step. Um, but just having the confidence to just know you know, when to ask and when, when to be present and just put myself out there. That's great. I uh, know you are a movie guy through and through, you know, huge, huge film guy. What are your five all time favorite movies? If you look behind me there and you can't see all of them, there are 1500 films here. This is the most difficult question people ask me. I have kind of narrowed it down to five. It's just kind of like pillars. I think there should be four pillars, but I'm at a fifth pillar. Uh, my five favorite movies, not the greatest movies ever made, just my favorite ones I go back to over and over again. Almost Famous, Casablanca, Psycho, uh, the South Korean version of Old Boy, the original Old Boy, and Pulp Fiction. Those are my five favorite movies. That's 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 a quite an extensive uh, array of, of movies. I love yeah. it. Uh, do you? What is the best movie ever made? Is, do you have an, an opinion on that? Oh gosh, I, that was, I was not prepped for that. Um, you know, a lot of people <laughs> say Citizen Kane. Um, I, I think that's a pretty good test book answer. I mean, I don't think there's a bad frame of the Godfather part two from like a technical standpoint of filmmaking of like, here's how to tell a story. Here's how to get your audience. I mean, that's a pretty perfect film. There's a lot of perfect movies out there. I don't think there's truly one greatest film ever made. Um, there's a lot that like, like there will be blood came out. What? 10, 15 years ago. I think that's pretty perfect. There's not like a, there's not a bad note in that one. <laughs> I love it. Uh, what are your favorite horror movies? Since oh, it's Halloween. Halloween today, isn't it? Um, I love, so I'm going to narrow it down because I like all horror movies. Probably, I would say the genre that's probably most represented behind me. I would say horror is probably one of the more popular ones that I have. Uh, my favorite horror movie of all time, I built my 40th birthday around it, is The Shining. Uh, we went to the Stanley Hotel in Estes Park, Colorado to see where Stephen King wrote the book. Um, my wife and I just watched it the other night. I love Stanley Kubrick, and he made, in my opinion, probably one of the greatest horror movies ever made. Uh, saying I like psychological horror, Rosemary's Baby, uh, more recent Midsommar, and just announced yesterday, um, a movie came out in, I think it was 2017, called It Follows. They just announced They Follow, so the sequel to uh, truly one of the more fun psychological horror movies. Like, nice, is it really nice. happening? No. I don't know. I love it. <laughs> we'll see. That's the thing with movies, right? You just never know until yeah. it's official. Uh, what's mm -hmm. your favorite trilogy of all time? Um, you know, I could say Indiana Jones. I could say Star Wars. But I'm, I, if I truly think of like my favorite trilogy, that word favorite is really important to me. Um, my wife and I recently sat down to watch the Before series. Uh, it's Before Sunrise, Before Sunset, Before Midnight. It's three Richard Linkletter films that follow one couple around their relationship. And, um, my wife and I getting to check in on that at different points in our lives has been truly one of the greatest gifts that being a cinephile has ever given to me. So that's my favorite awesome. trilogy. It's a little sentimental, but that's absolutely why. Cause of my wife. 
I love it. And it's cool that you guys have that that connection. Uh, in your expert opinion, what is the best movie sequel? So uh, that's a great question. I like how you said that. And I like that you call me an expert, even though, okay, I'll take it. Um, I, I think to be a truly great sequel, you need to embody what made the first one so great. And while it's not technically the first sequel, if you ask Steven Spielberg and George Lucas, they will say that Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade is the actual sequel to Raiders of the Lost Ark. Um, both of those films are perfect. And I think Last Crusade just definitely fills in what made Raiders so wonderful while being its own standalone great film. So I think it's the best movie sequel that's ever been made. And I know I said a lot of good things about The Godfather Part 2, but I mean, The Godfather two, Part 2 is better than Part 1, if we're being honest. Yeah. It, it truly, it's a better film. Um, but yeah, Raiders. Indiana Celeste Jones. It's beautiful. I love it. I love it. Uh, now, is there a movie that you're really looking forward to coming out? So for the last four years, it was Killers of the Flower Moon, but I saw it last week and it was awesome. Um, so now I'm just going to say The Iron Claw. I'm a big pro wrestling fan. And it's a oh, yeah. docu-film about the Von Erich family. Uh, there's Ooh. a huge pro wrestling family in Texas. Um, and a really cool director, uh, Sean McDermott's doing the film. So I'm looking forward to that. But, I mean, Killers of the Flower Moon was uh, it just on my calendar. And every year, like, well, it got backed up by COVID. And then it got backed up. Scorsese need to do reshoots. And I'm just like, please release this movie. And so it's I highly recommend it. It's in theaters now. Go see it. I like it. No, so yeah, I didn't. I didn't know that movie was coming out, but I remember the <laughs> Von Erichs and all the tragedies. Mm -hmm. Crazy, oh, awful family, but so talented in the world of wrestling. So that's exciting. When's that coming out? Do you know, uh, <laughs> it's supposed to come out the week before Christmas. I have already alerted my family. Like, if I need to leave for like two hours on Christmas Day, I don't want to catch any heat for that. If that's okay, guys. <laughs> um, but I'm I also getting it. the family on Christmas. But no, I'm I'm looking forward to that movie, The Iron Claw. Sounds good. Now, what's uh, what's the most overrated movie of all time? I even own it. So, like, how overrated can it be if I own it? But I'm just and let me give defense to why it's Forrest Gump. I truly believe it's the most overrated movie. Wow. It's a jukebox movie. A lot of great songs make it rewatchable. So you want to watch it? Oh, it's got a great soundtrack. Um, and none of the songs are original to it. It's all kind of nostalgia. Um, but here's why: two main reasons. It beat out Shawshank and Pulp Fiction for Best Picture. And that, yeah. in my heart, is a travesty yeah. of the Academy Awards. The largest one they've had since How Green Is Our Valley beat out Citizen Kane. Just terrible Oscar strategy. But also, like, from a different angle, Jenny really gets the raw end of the deal in that movie. There's no redeeming, <laughs> there's no redeeming moment for her in that entire movie. Um, yeah. Just the treatment of her is atrocious. I think in hindsight, you go back, you maybe just give Jenny a couple more light moments because it was just bleak for her, especially for a PG-13 movie. How are they letting 13-year-olds in this to watch that? I don't know. <laughs> but I've never been a huge Forrest Gump fan. I've gotten a lot of heat for it over the years. And part of it's kind of become a little bit of the character, but, you know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that poor uh, Jen. How do you say her name? Jenny. <laughs> Jenny. Yeah. Jenny. Uh, what are your favorite sports movies of all time? Uh, Bull Durham's my favorite sports movie. I know Ooh. I'm a big football fan, but... um. I, Kevin Costner in a baseball movie, just there's something about it. It's magical. Field of Dreams is great too, but Bull Durham, like, I, man, I, I think uh, I have my grandmother, um, Shirley Wright, uh, was a huge baseball fan, huge Atlanta Braves fan growing up. And uh, she sadly passed away at a young age, but when I was young and she was young too, she died of lung cancer. But the character Annie Savoy, it reminds oh. me a lot of what my grandparent or what people told me. Your grandmother was a lot like this. She was like, oh. just loved baseball, um, real charming, real Southern. And so like, I think part of it might lean into that's why I like it so much. But I mean, some of the one liners, like we're oh. dealing with a lot of insert word. Um, yeah. It's just, oh gosh. Yeah. Oh, I mean, who loves baseball? Nuke, La Nuke Lelouch and, and <laughs> Crash Davis. Like I was oh, looking the so other good. day, I was looking for a Crash Davis or a Nuke Lelouch jersey. That'd be great, right? Just to have that. So classic yeah. movie for sure. It definitely gets missed. You know, when, you know, I love, I personally, I love Major League a ton and mm -hmm. Field of Dreams is, is an all timer for me too. But, but Bull Durham, I mean, it's right there. It's, it's, uh, it's a special one. I think uh, sports movies are funny because sports in the moment like especially like you take a movie like miracle which is, it's a great movie but the problem is you it's really hard to recapture that moment and that's what makes sports yeah. so great so what, why i love movies like i'm not huge on a lot of sports movies believe it or not 
No, it's it, it makes sense. It's yeah. got to be the right. Well, it's got to be the right one with the right. I mean, again, Bull Durham's a perfect example. It's not, yeah. you know, it's not all, all about the the game and what happens. It's it's about you know the in between, which is good. So, hey, let's talk about mu- music for a second. As we all know, you know, Taylor Swift is is taking over the world, and and now the NFL with the uh, Travis Kelsey romance. Uh, I, I noticed on December 8, 2012, you tweeted, I wish all Taylor Swift's music took the direction of mean and eyes open. So as you look back on this on this tweet and hot take, what uh, what are your thoughts on how things have played out for Taylor since that time? I, I love Taylor Swift. I will never go against her. I have become a huge, a much bigger fan of folklore in the last, I would say, three months. Um, yeah. I am a huge fan of that album. I love True, I do love everything that's happening right now with her and Travis. It's bringing new eyes into the game. Um, my wife, who knows about football, but she's very invested in this relationship. And it's been a really nice conversation piece to have there of like, oh, Taylor's at the game and she'll sit there and watch the game with me. And that's like, that's really great to have. And I think people dogging on it, like need to look kind of at the bright side of it. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I, I So my daughter just turned 11 uh, a few mm-hmm. days ago. Uh, we went to the Eras tour. Um, so our last, you know, year has been consumed with Taylor Swift. I mean, back 1989 came out like on her second birthday. So when she oh, was wow. little, we were always listening to music. So we've always had this thing with with Taylor Swift together. So it's been fun to see this whole thing come out. Is yeah. so is folklore? Is that officially your favorite album? You know, I, I for my birthday I had Liz Loza on the FYF show for my birthday extravaganza, and she asked me like. And I said, I think 1989 is my era, but uh, man, I think folklore might be my era. I just, it's my vibe. I just really, I think if you took folklore and evermore and you took like the six best songs of both of them, you slapped it together. That's, that's the perfect Taylor Swift album, but probably folklore. Like I, okay, okay. every song is great. Yeah. I feel like with 80, 89, it's like, is like the, maybe the best pop album of all time. It's fun. Right? Oh my God. It's so, so much fun. It, yeah. Like it's, it's like you separate that and then you can kind of, Look at the other ones it, for like a, a kind of a personal favorite, but you got to respect '89. Obviously, it's a, it's a big one. So, what uh, what's your favorite song, Taylor Swift song, of all time? Oh man, um, oh, it's probably still Mean. I th- I think Mean's a all great right. song. Okay. And it's a nice bridge song from like the all the aspects of her career because that whole Speak Now album, like I, that was definitely one of my favorite albums. And the, I think the reason I was like I backed off a little bit was when Red came out. I was like, oh man, that's such a departure um but i i've grown to love it and this isn't someone pointing a gun on my head or anything to say you have to like it um, <laughs> i love it. i truly do i mean you, you mature with music as, as years go and um sometimes i have a little more fun but I yeah i think oh, yeah. probably it's probably still my favorite song okay okay yeah so with folklore you know that was one of those ever more you know not as much but but folklore really yeah, snuck up on our rankings well. with me and my daughter <laughs> right we we actually did like a podcast just on ranking top 50 Taylor Swift songs right ahead of nice. our, the concert we went to. So it was so much fun. And and I will say that Folklore's got a, a, just a lot of bangers that have went up on the list for us for sure. Yeah. Let's uh, <laughs> let's talk. Keep trade cut. Disney World, Universal Studios, or SeaWorld? I will um, keep Disney trade universal studios and i'll cut sea world um even though sea world's really rebounding i and i'll tell you why i'm going to cut sea world and i hope that we won't get any trouble through the sponsors but <laughs> i had set up a really great interaction for starts and salutations at sea world where i was going to interview a walrus as andy reed had the glasses and the hat and they agreed to it and everything and i show up to record on the day and they said yeah, we're not going to allow you to record this with the walrus and I was so that's why I'm cutting SeaWorld. It's a personal vendetta. Yeah. Just get I rid love of them. It. <laughs> yeah. But and, no. we, we did have passes to SeaWorld and we enjoyed their food and wine festival. So oh that's great. Now yeah, Disney. I mean, we just went to Orlando um this like over uh late or Memorial Day weekend or Labor Day weekend. So we did it just like in three days. We went to Disney, went Perfect. to three parks at Disney like one day, Universal two days. Um, you know, you can't I, I feel like you can't cut or trade disney it's it's its own thing but man yeah. universal is special like did you have you gone have you been to it with like the newer rides like the the jurassic park one the only one i haven't ridden is velocicoaster oh. i've 
Rin Haggard's and all the other ones, but okay. I, I've really wanted to. But I found out recently at SeaWorld at the Food and Wine Festival that my 41 year old body can't handle the roller coasters like my 25 year old body could. Yeah. Um, so I think that's part of why I want to, why I would say I would trade Universal is because I, I just can't handle the rides anymore because I'm an old man. And Universal, yeah. listen, they said the Alfred Hitchcock soundstage, and I'm still a little sore they took that out because, like, for a movie nerd, like, show me how they made Psycho. I, I'll sit there and watch it all day. <laughs> That's awesome. Now we are talking about these Orlando re- resorts because you're mm-hmm. an Orlando guy. Yes. So just perfect. to just to clarify to the listeners and viewers out there, um, but yeah, so Universal. I mean that that Velocicoaster is intense. <sighs> it's wild. It looks awesome. But, <laughs> but Hagrid's that was that was amazing. Like on the motorbike deal. Oh yeah. Um, but I would say that our by far and away our favorite ride is Guardians at Epcot. Have you done that okay. one yet? I've heard um, a, I heard bring, bring a puke bag. I've heard it gets intense. Uh, I would say for us, it was just like the smoothest, best okay. roller coaster we've ever been on. We've been on a lot, and nice. if you haven't done that yet, you know, because your 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 kids are what? How old? Like I have a almost four year old and a seven. She just turned seven. Okay, Two okay, so yeah. So you're kind of right. You're getting in there, right? So, mm-hmm. so I'm sure you're going to see all those rides. But yeah, that that Absolutely. that Guardians ride is is phenomenal. So, just you know, my two cents. Uh, can you name a person in the industry that you'd want to watch a football game with, just to hear their insight and, and perspective on the great game of football? I I'm kind of cheating here because I got a little preview of it. Um, I got to watch a preseason game with Jordan Vanek from the 33rd team. He's one of my good friends in the industry. Um, Jordan's mind for football is unlike any other one I know. He is so bright and he explains it in a way that like makes me love the game even more. So I would love to sit down and watch because he's a Panthers fan and watch a Bucks Panthers game with Jordan Vanek. I like that. No, that's that's a good one. Um, when it comes to the actual game of football, if you had to fill a running back spot on your football team, would you rather have Emmett Smith or Barry Sanders? I mean, Emmett was my first favorite player ever. Um, I had posters of both of these guys on my wall though. The Barry Sanders one I got from little Caesars pizza. And it was one of those like super, super tall ones. Oh, nice. Um, so I, Barry did it for a short amount of time and did it better, but Emmett Smith had all, that longevity. So I want to win a bunch of super bowls. So I'm going to have Emmett Smith. <laughs> That's good. No, I, I, I mean, could, could you imagine Barry behind that Dallas offensive line though at, at his peak? <laughs> I mean, it's pretty, pretty special, yeah. but I, you know, I, that was my, you know, my era, you know, I, Barry's my guy. Obviously we can see Barry right here. Um, so I just remember all that, you know, that oh. time period where it's like, Oh, get, you know, Barry had some rough offensive lines, but Emmett it's, it's a shame that, that people, when they talk about all time running backs, that they don't, that they always go, you know, Barry, Walter Payton, Jim Brown, um, that they don't just automatically include Emmett because Emmett was, you're right the endurance the longevity i mean the guy was a warrior so you know he may not have had the the moves that barry had but i mean reliability you know all around back you know i gotta say that emmett was was definitely special so i mean i'll, I'll take barry but he's my uh, first he's my first football jersey emmett smith it was a orange florida gators uh emmett smith jersey that they awesome. couldn't put his name on they could just have 22 is all they could i love it like and say licensing or whatever. Oh, sure, sure, sure. So obviously we're 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 deep into 2023. What are your what are your impressions thus far with with where we're at in the season? I would say this is like truly feels like one of the more unpredictable seasons at running back and wide receiver. We're at quarterback. I feel like it's just following the same script as it has every year. I think it's been a lot of fun. Um, a little more frustrating maybe than past ones. Even though I'm doing good, I'm still frustrated why I'm doing good. I won last night. On the last play of the game, because of a 150 yard rushing um, bonus, oh um, geez. that um, Jameer Gibbs got. Um, so I think it was actually the second last scoring play of the game that oh um, I could have scored on, and I just I won by like a point and a half, and I was like, oh, it's frustrating. <laughs> I don't like those Monday night beats that I have to stay up. For oh, it's, <laughs> I took the worst beat last night. Um, no, I mean in, I'm in the uh, the Ian Fish Bowl. With my daughter, right? So it's my okay. daughter. It's Liz loaded. Liz loves his son. It's Ian Fish. It's um. It, I mean, there's a few. Basically, there's like six kids and two adults that are in this eight man league, um, and I lost to Ian Fish by like point three. Like the Laporta drop. He, dro- oh, he dropped. He oh. dropped. Just like it was over. 
I was going to take down Ian Fish for the second time last night, and there it happens. Ian's to- really good, and it's <laughs> like it's annoying. Like, no, he's I'm wearing the uh, the Ian Fish ball as well, but for the uh, I think we're the age bracket down. Oh, okay, um, okay, yeah, we're in there with the um, who are the two little girls? Um, the Gabby girls, what are they called? You know, what I'm talking about uh, Kelly, no, uh, Singnas, okay. Uh, they do a little show that they have. They do Star Sits. Uh, oh, really? Little two girls. Oh, I think I they're to... probably like six and eight years old. They're so cute. Oh, really? Um, oh, we beat them last night, my daughter and I. Oh, nice. So <laughs> let's Take go. that. Team Take Alligator that. Bubblegum. That's our team name. <laughs> oh, that's fun. Yeah, it's been fun. Obviously, Scott yeah, putting, that together, Ian putting that together. Uh, it's been it's been fun. So I think I've lost twice this year. One to Liz Lowe's son and one to Scott Fish's son. So, But I'm in first place. Okay. <laughs> I'll let you know that I'm playing a bunch of bunch of 10 and 11 year olds i'm in first place for sure. now <laughs> what uh can you uh obviously we got you know we still got you know half a season left to go or more i guess uh name two quarterbacks that you want to you know, have on your rosters two two quarterbacks that you expect to have a strong finish the rest of the way yeah just last night jerk off um i was big on the beginning of the season and he's the qb 11 right now and he's got still two matchups left against the bears coming up um week 10 matchup against the broncos I was high on him to begin the year, and I was saying that Jared Goff, when he's at home playing, he's money, but he's been money on the road, too. He beat up my Tampa Bay Buccaneers big time this year in a week that I benched him, which I was really sad about because I'm like, oh, well, the Bucs, he's away from home. Jared Goff can't play. No, they've got something brewing there in Detroit. I went Jared Goff on all my fantasy teams, and luckily I have him on quite a few. Somebody I don't have a lot of, and I would love to acquire him, if you have parts of Lamar Jackson, please send all of them to me because I mm-hmm. would like them. Um he finally has a competent wide receiver one in Zay Jones. And it's exciting to see uh, Mark Andrews is still going to be involved there. Um, he's got that rushing upside uh, schedule ahead. It's great for Lamar. I just, yeah, I think he's going to be rostered on a lot of championship ro- uh, rosters this year. That's great. And with like a Jared Goff, how nice is it to have a Jameer Gibbs catching balls, right? You can just quick <sighs> little screen and you got, you got a uh, daylight ahead of you. So I'm excited for, for him for sure. How about a couple of running backs? Six, oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, go ahead. I, was, I needed 63 points last night, and I had Jared Goff and Jameer Gibbs, and I got oh, 65 Did points. you get it? Yeah, I got him. Oh. So that's why I won the game, yeah. But, I love it. I love it. Uh, can you name a couple running backs you're excited about? Yeah, Isaiah Pacheco, RB9 on the season, and PPR. Um, from week 12 on, he doesn't face a top 15 against uh, against the run. Uh, he's leading the Chiefs in carries, and he's third on the team in targets. And then somebody that's rostered on pretty much every uh, league out there. I think he's the number one fantasy player rest of the season. That's Austin Eckler. Um, week 14, championship matchup against the Broncos. Um, oh, sorry. He plays Detroit and then draws a week 14 matchup against the Broncos. Really great playoff schedule. Um, and the Broncos are giving up the most fantasy points to opposing running backs. Um, Austin Eckler's a stud. And now that he's back healthy. Um, I think he's the number one fantasy player rest of the season. Yeah, if he stays healthy, I mean, he's he's as dynamic as it gets. Uh, can you name a couple wide receivers you're excited about the rest of the way? Yeah, T. Higgins and Brandon Ayuk, um, two quote unquote wide receiver twos on their teams, but I think they have wide receiver one upside. T. Higgins, we really haven't seen a lot from him this year. Uh, we were just talking about him with Alfredo Brown and Dave Kluge on the Football Guy show that's coming out later today. Are we afraid of T. Higgins? And I'm not. I think a lot of the downplay from T. Higgins this year had a lot to do with the easing in of Joe Burrow. Joe Burrow's back now. Uh, T. Higgins, I think it was five receptions for 69 yards last week. Uh, the touchdowns will come. I think T. Higgins is going to have a great rest of the season. And Brandon Ayuk, just a great rest of the season schedule. Um, no firm timetable for Debo's return. Um, and even when Debo's there, he's still heavily involved. Um, I like him a lot as well. Yeah, I like the T. Higgins call just because, yeah, obviously it looks like Burrow's coming back, so it'd be a great time to to catch him on the on the rise. Uh, can you name a couple tight ends that you're excited about the rest of the way? Uh, a streaming option, David Njoku, because not everybody gets one of those, you know, sure thing tight ends. Uh, David Njoku's got a pretty good ski, uh, schedule rest of the season. Uh, he's got rapport with both P.J. Walker and Deshaun Watson, so no matter who's throwing the ball, he's getting looks. Um, and I'm I'm sorry he's coming off the best game of the season against your Seahawks, but uh, he looked good <laughs> last week. So, <laughs> Hey, we, we got the win, and we look yeah. good. How about those uniforms? Yeah. Uh, this I love the throwback uniforms they chose this year. 
um, no. with the Oilers and the Buccaneers. I bought a oh. creamsicle Mike Evans jersey yeah. Yeah. the moment they went on sale. Yeah. And I love the Seahawks ones as well. I've actually wanted to get a Seahawks one. I just can't figure out which player I want to get. Like part of me wants to get Tyler Lockett just because I have a lot of history. I'm on the fantasy teams. Yeah. But I kind of want to get a Zach Charbonnet jersey because he he's speaking the interest there. Um, yeah, no, that's – yeah, I was gonna say that's a you know interesting one. It's hard, so hard to get current players. You just don't know where they're going. Like, yeah. um, I mean, yeah. So I mean, like a locket. That's like a. I feel like that's a solid one because what a great player he's been all these years. Like he's just mm-hmm. he's such an incredible receiver, underappreciated. That's one of those ones where you know you wear it ten years from now, people will be like, yeah, I like that. Do I go the humorous route and get a Bobo jersey though? Like, is that oh, the move? I mean, that's phenomenal. That that's move? phenomenal. Yeah. I think that uh, that that's the guy. I got my, you know my best friends is looking at at getting one. I'm like, you know, I mean, right now he's 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 a fan favorite. He's beloved. You know, he's one of be those just those key guys that just contributes for for a handful of years. Um, you know, obviously or more. Um, but even if it if it if it crumbles, you know, down the road, it's like that's fun. Remember, remember that. So so Bobo, it would be good. That, that would be good. <laughs> I like that. But you're right, the Houston Oilers, like when I saw that, when I saw Will Levis out there chucking the ball around, I was like, that's that's cool. I like I like those memories too. I I have a theory that I think that's the only reason Levis was good was because yeah. those jerseys were so awesome. <laughs> And the defenders couldn't take their eyes off of them. Like that's yeah, my theory we'll... of why Levis was so good last week, because uh, nobody saw that coming. <laughs> yeah, we'll see. We'll see on Thursday night when uh, when yeah, Watt is, uh, is pursuing him. So so that'd be fun. It'd be fun to see Will Levis get out there and, and chuck it around. Obviously, you know, situation like that. I mean, you might have just let him let him, you know, get out there and sling it around and see what see what they got in him. So. Hmm. Now, obviously, you have uh, you've done an incredible job forging your path in the fantasy industry and making some incredible connections along the way. Uh, can you name a few people that have just had a massive impact on you during your journey in the fantasy industry? Any decision I've made in this industry, I've gone to Dave Richard first, and I feel so fortunate that he um, doesn't ignore me for more than two hours to answer my questions. Um, I would not be here without Dave and he will hate me for saying this and I care less. And I always tell him I'm never going to do it again, but I'll do it again. I'll do it again next week. If somebody asks me the same question. Um, so Dave Richard a lot just to help me make good decisions and make sure that I was taken care of in the decisions. And I will be forever thankful for that. Um, somebody else that we both know and love Scott fish become one of my closest friends in this industry. Anything good in me is probably because I saw Scott do it first and I just copied him. Um, I've enjoyed writing his coattails to just being a good guy and finding my own way to be a good guy. Um, what he does charitably and just who he is as a person, um, love Scott fish and, um, just the team at FYF. Like they have been so fantastic for me, Simon and JL and Jay, um, and Josh Fuster too was there in the beginning. Um, just truly, truly great guys, especially not, I mean to say, especially Simon, but I have built a, a great list with Simon and then a football guys. I'm, um, Dave Kluge has become one of my best friends and um, truly like when you get to sit down and talk to him, just a real fun guy. My wife and I um, spent time with him and Emily, uh, his wife, Emily, who if the Hills have pies, delicious yeah. pies. Um, <laughs> we went to a concert at Red Rocks, which has been like my um, oh. bucket list music venue to go to. Once all the Ava brothers yeah. at Red Rocks had a great time there with those guys. And Dave's just one of the best guys, Alfredo, Joe, everybody, Jeff Bell, everybody at football guys. I, I've met so many wonderful people. I know you said name three, but I named like 10. Totally acceptable. I left people off. <laughs> <laughs> all worthy, all worthy. And, and yeah, if, if people are on the list, you know, they know where they stand with yeah, you. Again, yeah. you've been outstanding uh, connecting with so many great people. You know, I love your impact on this community, your positivity, your humor, um, all the great things you do. Now, obviously, you know, you've, you've experienced quite a bit over the last few years. Do you have any advice for aspiring fantasy sports analysts and people looking to get more involved in the industry? Um, I, I'm kind of tooting my horn a lot here today, but I guess that's what the show's about. Um, <laughs> you know, I, 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 I like to think of myself as a good person, but um, I truly feel like what set me apart in this industry was something that I knew I was good at that had nothing to do with fantasy football. And that's when I made starts and citations because um, that's kind of what, gave me a face it's my avatar on twitter for goodness sake so i would say look at what you're good at in your current occupation or your your hobby or whatever in life it's not necessarily in fantasy football figure out 
how to apply those skills to fantasy football. I was a big theater kid. I did improv comedy. I did sketch comedy. I took that and I was like, let's now make that about fantasy football. And that's kind of what gave me one of my biggest steps in this industry. So I would tell people that like, if you're looking for something to do, just do what you're good at, but make that work with fantasy football and be a good person. Don't be a jerk. Like just be nice, be good, be nice. As many doors as I, I, I often will say this, no fantasy stat I've ever given has opened a single door for me in this industry. It's all because I've been a, a nice person and B because I look funny in a hat. <laughs> <laughs> Great advice for sure. Obviously, yeah. you know, yeah, be a good person. It goes a long, long it way. Does. It truly uh, does. And then I like what you said, just, you know, being bringing your authentic self, you know, what makes mm -hmm. you, you bringing that into, into your, your identity within the space uh, definitely allows you to kind of separate yourself and, and, and just be comfortable, be comfortable with who you are. I love it. Well, Joey, is there anything that we haven't covered that you'd like to share before we close things out here today? Um, I guess if people need to know about me, like, does he just watch football and movies? No, I've got a wonderful family. I've got a wife. Uh, we've been together since um, God, I was like 22, got married, 31. Just love my life. I got two beautiful daughters because of her. Um, and outside of that, like every Saturday morning, we're watching Liverpool matches because we're huge Liverpool supporters. In my household, I fell in love with um, the other football about four World Cups ago and uh, had a friend that was a big Liverpool supporter, took me to a supporter group, and I've never turned back since. And um, I love Japanese pro wrestling. I think it's some of the coolest uh, performance art in the world that nobody ever really gets to see. It's very different than American pro wrestling. It's, it's, it's seen almost like ballet, but so Japanese pro wrestling. Yeah, I'm a pretty that's easy awesome. guy. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. That's, that's something I'll have to, to dive into. Yeah. Um, you know, got to gotta love it. You know, obviously you are a very dynamic individual. It's been a pleasure to have you on. Uh, tell the listeners and viewers where they can find you on social media. Oh, you can find me on X or Twitter, wherever we're calling it this week, at the Joey Wright. Um, Sunday mornings over at uh, Football Guys YouTube. We're doing the Sunday morning show over there. I'm hosting it. I don't know what they were thinking, letting you do that. But we're having a good time over there with Jagger and Jeff Bell and Adam Hutchinson. And then uh, Front Yard Fantasy on Thursdays, we got the game show at three o'clock. Yeah, you got it. If you haven't seen the game show on Front Yard Fantasy, it's it's an amazing amount of fun. It's just, just great guys again. Love that show for sure. So again, Joey, thank you so much for joining me on this episode. I thank cannot wait me. to see what. Yeah, it's an absolute pleasure. Can't wait to see what's next for you, my friend. Thank you for listening to the Fantasy Football Unlimited Podcast. Until next time. Be sure to follow and subscribe to all of FFU's social media accounts for daily content. <laughs>